Welcome back. My name is Tamara Bentley, and we are going to have a panel titled China Studies Beyond Borders, Connective and Comparative Histories. And this is obviously an interdisciplinary panel, as you can tell. Um, I think the ideal way to start would be to have each person introduce themselves and a little something about their work that relates to either comparative history or connective histories. Marty doesn't have a name, a name tag on <laughs> But we Imagine thought that was no <laughs> sort of like Tao Yan Ming playing the uh, chin without strings, so he doesn't need a name tag. <laughs> so um, Marty, could you just, each person has about three minutes to introduce one or two works that take these kind of approaches. Yeah. Yes, well, um, I suppose the, the uh, primary example would be the book that just, just appeared, uh, which is explicitly um, comparative, but in, I, I should say in, in a way which I think is perhaps, um, I like to think is a little more rigorous than simply saying this is what they did here and that's what they did there. And to this I, I, I owe a lot to Lydia Leo. I, I use her uh, translingual analysis. Uh, method where you let, say, Englishmen talk about China or translate Chinese texts and then you look at, you know, how that works out. So um, that that book explores that method as well as uh, uh, what you might call transvisual analysis, what happens when they try to visualize something uh, from another culture. Um, the earlier instances of that, there's a little bit in the other two books. Um, but especially in uh, David Porter's uh, wonderful volume, uh, Comparative Early Modernities, I think that was uh, an instance where I tried that kind of method a bit more explicitly before, before the book. The subject of comparison and connection is one that I'm deeply interested in, and I don't know how I'm going to do this in three minutes. Also, I'll do it autobiography. I started out in English literature. I never took any Asian history when I was an undergraduate. Um, and I think I became interested in China because it wasn't the West. So I started out understanding China as a position of difference that I wanted to take. Um, once I began teaching uh, at university after my PhD, I taught at the University of Toronto. I was the only East Asian historian in a department of over 50 people. Um, so if I wanted to have conversations with anyone, they had to be conversations that were based on a comparative framework. Um, and the students seemed to found that, find that interesting. That's in the 80s, at a, a point at which comparison had been pretty much dismissed as a CIA plot, fair <laughs> enough. Um, and we were now beginning to think about connecting, that you don't just put two things beside each other, but you look at the things that link those two things once you put them beside each other. And so that led me into global history. Um, as a graduate student, I was very interested in a kind of a Perry Anderson-style structures of analysis that would, that would bring the world together in a way that you didn't do comparison or connection. But then I've, I've gone more to the connective side of things. And uh, the talk I gave today was an attempt to think, um, it's a book of 13 chapters. In every one of those chapters, I connect China to somewhere. And I, I, I don't allow Chinese history to narrate itself. It can only be narrated if you're narrating what it's in connection with. Um, okay, so um, for me, um, actually doing a comparative study is, depending on how you look at things, relatively new. Um, but with my, uh, the Sino-Vietnamese tea project that I discussed yesterday, um, that one in particular uh, brings together a, a cross-cultural comparisons. And um, the, one of the reasons that I'm really interested in this um, is because it's a really dis way to look at something quite distinct and see how culture spreads and is adapted, ado adopted, adapted, or rejected. And so I think that's a really useful way of understanding uh, how, how the forces of culture 
um, can work on different societies. And um, the other aspect about it that I particularly enjoy is that by doing this kind of work, we get to learn more about each culture than we would have otherwise, and we that would have otherwise been accessible to us because the kinds of questions that occurred wouldn't have uh, uh, the a possibility of occurring uh, if we weren't doing this kind of cultural comparison. So I really think it's a, a wonderful approach. And um, yeah, that's me. That's you. Hi, uh, I've been teaching comparative literature for a long time. I don't have a choice <laughs> here. Uh, uh, let me begin uh, by just saying uh, uh, how Marty's work uh, is uh, deeply related to what I have been trying to do. Uh, we met in Berkeley when I was still teaching at Berkeley. Maybe that was, I don't know if it was the first time, the second time, but uh, in the late 90s, I believe. Um, so. And his work struck me as always being um, a, a exemplary of a, a cross-disciplinary work. And he asks questions that political scientists fail to ask, which is very interesting. But he asks questions about politics. Mm -hmm. um, his, his, his earlier work, uh, first book, Art and Political Expression in Early China, uh, and, and also his uh, pattern and person. Um, it is always uh, uh, about these uh, uh, fundamental issues in a society. Um, and then I, when I met him, and we would have a conversation, and all of a sudden he would give me a few lines of Susha's poem, <laughs> which uh, really uh, uh, um, uh, were very enduring because I'm in literature and he, he was just, uh, and, and then I found out after I moved to uh, 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 University of Michigan where I taught for five years, um, starting from 2002, um, he actually memorized a lot of song um, poems, shi and ci, and so he crossed over into literature, and he was, he's, he's an art historian, and he's uh, deep, deeply committed to clarifying some political issues, authority, equality, uh, problems of justice, and these are enduring concerns in his work, with which I identify very much. I didn't talk about my own work, but I, I do <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, have uh, one last thing to say about our connections. We have been, uh, uh, friends and interlocutors for a long time. And then he involved me in one of his pedagogical projects uh, a, a long time ago. I think uh, it's still housed I at the Center for Chinese Studies called the China Mirror Project. Mm -hmm. and, and at this conference, we haven't really talked about Marty's pedagogy, which is very, very important. And he, one day he asked me, he said, oh, we got an NEH grant. Uh, we're going to do some public outreach. Can you write a module for me? I said, <laughs> he says, each module would concern an object. And I said, what object can I bring? And then I said, why don't I write about how to read a treaty? <laughs> So then, so that started, I, I found out that it's still there uh, on the website. Um, uh, Marty's first, uh, you wrote a module on a Han mirror, yes. right? Okay, mm -hmm. how to read a mirror, how to read this and that. So, and he went out of his way when he was in Taipei to get the original treaty. This, this is a, um, Article 50, uh, 51 of uh, uh, the Treaty of Tianjin. He got the original and he, a, a, a scan it and then put it on the website. And so here is an art historian dealing with texts and texts having to do with international politics. So, okay, so I took up more than my three minutes. So there you go. <laughs> Well, I guess the theme of our, uh, our panel so far this afternoon is about um, disciplinary crossings of various kinds. Uh, Tim said he, he confessed he began as, a, as, as, as an English student to move to Chinese history. I guess it, I, I, could, I could equally well say that I began in, in, in Chinese history and moved to English literature. <laughs> I had a, um, a formative course with uh, the Chinese historian Sherman Cochran um, at Cornell many years ago, and which was a, 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 a tremendous um, inspiration for me in various ways. Uh, like Marty, I've been involved in thinking uh, China and Europe together in various ways through most of my career. Uh, 
in the, especially in the early modern period, my first two books, I guess if we're thinking about this comparison history, connection history dichotomy, were more on the um, connection history side, thinking about questions of re uh, reception and response and interpretation of um, things and ideas, Chinese in the European context. Uh, more recently, I've uh, turned to the back to the comparative vein. I'm, I'm interested in reviving the old CIA plot, I guess. <laughs> um, it, is, it is decidedly untrendy, I'm, I'm discovering. And I'm, I'm part, of, part of why I'm, I'm, I'm curious about it is I'm, I'm interested in why it's, it's so out of fashion and what its unfashionability as an approach obscures from our view. Uh, Many of the people at, on, this, on this panel and at this conference have been inspirations to me in, in, in these pursuits. I'd also, another, uh, somebody who's not here and in a very different field from not only English but art history is Ken Pomerantz. I, I found his Great Divergence book um, tremendously eye-opening as, kind of, um, as a kind of source of possible methodologies and paradigms for thinking about questions in my own field. Um, as, as, as you all know, his book uh, offers strong evidence of roughly parallel economic developments in, in um, <clears throat> parts of Europe and parts of China over several hundred years up to 1800, and with, with the effect of calling into question longstanding claims of deep-seated European cultural exceptionalism. And I've, I've obviously, as, as an English literature professor, I've been aware of similar kinds of Eurocentric biases in my own field, uh, which has then left me wondering, after reading that book, whether the Pomerantz approach, others like it, might be extended beyond economic history to the broader realm of cultural and specifically literary history. Uh, and um, so I've, I've, I've undertaken a project over the past few years of, of, of trying to um, think creatively and expansively about literary sites of interesting comparison, unexpected affinities, um, as John Longshu would call them, and, and, and parallels in the early modern period in the spaces of vernacular narrative fiction, for example, conduct manuals, dictionaries, satire, where you see all sorts of um, emergences of certain kinds of literary trends, uh, genres, motifs, and so on, at roughly uh, corresponding times uh, in both locations in ways that don't make a lot of sense, according to the paradigms that we, we, we've got so far. So I, I, I find this project interesting in its possibilities for affording ways to see familiar European objects or British objects uh, from a new perspective offered by the Chinese vantage point. Uh, you know, what, what does, what does uh, Fielding's Joseph Andrews look like, the novel Joseph Andrews, if read through the perspective offered by Wu Jingzi's The Scholars, for example. But it also is a project that seems to me uh, offers possibilities for uh, decentering gestures of the kind proposed by the very term global early modernity. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I continue to be intrigued by this and, and, and continue to be inspired by, by many of the people in this room. Thank you. Um, and I'll just say that I, I recently finished editing a volume called Picturing Commerce in and from the East Asian Maritime Circuits, 1550 to 1800. And it's completely influenced by Morty because I just told the publisher, why can't we have the historians and the art historians in the same volume and the music historian as well? They might as well all be in one book. And it has so much to do with economics and not just art. They're very intertwined. So um, we're going to be asking the audience for questions shortly. Um, I thought I would touch on a few things first. Um, I. I was going to return to you, David, and ask um, how would you say that Chinese scholars' rocks and garden rockeries were perceived in 18th century Britain, where the British seemed to have been fascinated with grottos and caves? Is that too specific? No. <laughs> I, it, it certainly is an intriguing question, and it, it, I think it's one that's uh, there are all sorts of good reasons to ask, given the the fascination with gardens in both of these um, cultural contexts in roughly the same period, and the kinds of uh, weight that were given to the aesthetics of gardening uh, in 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 both um, Europe, England specifically, and and in China. Uh, and certainly in terms of their prominence and their overall mass and shape, uh, it's, it's possible to make um, certain kinds of comparisons between uh, traditional scholar stones and, and you know, European statuary, for example, in, in, in traditional formal uh, or classical gardens. So it's something I've, I found myself um, thinking a lot about. I, th I think at, at 
this point, I, I wouldn't venture much farther than saying that the although there's 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 a lot of a lot that's been written about uh, Sharawaji and you know the influence in, in very specific ways of, of Chinese gardening practice and theory in 18th century England. I, I guess I'm at the point of thinking of uh, the awareness of these Chinese norms as being something of a catalyst. Uh, to move along or to shape or give a, a new kind of direction to an aesthetic transformation that obviously was overdetermined in the in 18th century British context that roughly moved us from the kind of neoclassical to the romantic um, aesthetic uh, paradigms. Uh, so the, the, the Chinese rocks and awareness of them through all sorts of pictorial, uh, pictorial forms helped to legitimate, I think, new forms of seeing and imagining seeing and imagining uh, that were already in emergence, uh, but you know, these, these rocks might have given them, them a, a, you know, a, 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 a foreign habitation and a name, as it were, and helped to instantiate new kinds of aesthetic ideals in a particular way. Um, I guess the, the, the one place where I would stretch that um, answer just a little bit would be to suggest that the history of this assimilation of Chinese gardening practice into 18th century British cultural norms um, may have contributed, among other things, to the emergence of a British aesthetic nationalism that we associate with the later 18th century and early 19th century. I think there's a kind of backlash that we can um, point to where as British who are increasingly concerned about their own aesthetic identity, their own, the aesthetic dimensions of their national identity begin to be repudiate in quite explicit and sometimes frustrated and angry terms the signs of, 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 of foreign effects on the way that they're seeing the world. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there. That's great. Um, and I was going to ask Marty about Louis XIV. <laughs> I'm sorry, about what? Uh, about Louis XIV and the interest in chinoiserie at the French Louis court. Quattro Louis XIV. Oh, Louis XIV. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, 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 sorry. yeah. <laughs> and the French court and how y there might have been interest um, on the part of the Enlightenment thinkers to critique uh, the king and then on his side to kind of use things Chinese to defend himself in some sense. Okay, there are, there, are, there are lots of interesting things in, in that question and, and they have to do with translation, some of them. Um, uh, I, my work is focused more on England and more on um, uh, the 18th century. And this, but indeed, it does begin uh, with Louis the Fourteenth and, and that era when uh, they were picking up motifs and things uh, from China. But one of the one of the um, interesting effects is is indeed um, what gets lost in translation, right? So, for example, and and. Uh, Possibly Tim can correct me here, because again, this is this isn't the focus of my research. My um, certainly, I can think of many examples with uh, Montesquieu, where he totally misinterprets, and I think deliberately, um, the Chinese uh, terms. Uh, so, so for example, he he basically steals from Mencius the notion that um, you know the the um, monarch should share with the people his joys. In other words. At a very minimum, everyone in the kingdom should be able to live a happy life, raise their kids, take care of their parents, and if that's not the case, there's something wrong with the government, and it, you know, it could even be replaced. Um, Louis the Fourteenth uh, does this sort of trick. I believe the notion of the Chinese um, Yushu, or the uh, Department of Investigation, which basically prosecuted abuse of power among officials. It wasn't directed at the people. Um, uh, if I could be mistaken, but my memory is that Louis turns it around and says, oh, that means the king needs to have spies. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna have spies. That's right, I got all these spies working for me. Well, that wasn't the idea at all. It was just, it was just the opposite of that, right? So, um, and likewise, uh, we find uh, misreadings of Chinese gardens where again, you because you not because they're French and not because the Chinese are Chinese. Uh, this, as you know, this is one of my themes. It's not about culture. Actually, it has more to do with structural features and institutions. But uh, China was a post-aristocratic society by then. So, um, if you had a garden, the point wasn't to show your grandeur or your majesty. It, it was more about uh, subtler aspects of taste and choice and so on. And, um, and the French tend to uh, totally misinterpret that. I mean, Lecomte, for example, he says, the Chinese have no sense of uh, ornament, you know, they, they don't understand ornament, by which he means parterres, 
and statues and things that make you look really grand. Um, and and you know and 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 they're you know they're not much given to ordering their gardens. You know, so he just totally misunderstands uh, how this works. But then again, it wouldn't be long, you know, uh, as David has shown for England, and. Uh, in France, where they start to use these things for very much for their own purposes. Again, uh, I, I would just like to make it as a matter of record that in, in this entire book, and in fact, in fact, I think in all my books, the word influence never appears. Okay, <laughs> so this isn't one of this isn't the frame I'm talking about. We have a, a, a mixing and blending, which is uh, very interesting. Well, I have a quote here from Catherine's book. I've got Catherine's book, Dimensions of Originality, uh, Essays on 17th Century Chinese Art Theory and Criticism, for those who haven't seen it. Um, and this section reads, in other words, when the issue is not whether originality is a legitimate value, the question can be what is legitimized by the absenting of originality. That means uh, Europeans talking about Chinese art and not being willing to use the term originality. If one accepts modernist critics' claims that originality and its related concepts of difference, newness, and contemporane contemporaneity are the sole domain of the modern West, then the absenting of originality in China consigns China forever to a non-modern realm where it remains securely the object of Orientalist and Occidentalist fantasies. So Catherine, I wanted to ask um, whether your situating of this discourse around originality was partly speaking back to that kind of um, yeah. subjecting China to forever being right. backwards and non-original. <laughs> right. Thank you, that's am I, am I live? You're pressing the ah. yeah. um, Thank you for that question and um, here I want to say thank you to Marty for helping me see uh, much of that argument. Um, indeed, um, a, one of the things I like in research is to find an issue um, and uh, discover that there's something absent and then try to understand why something is absent. And in this case, um, uh, in, that, in this case, as I built my argument, I drew very heavily on Shireen Shu from UCLA, who's a literature, com comparative literature scholar, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and she did this brilliant, sh thank you, um, and did this really fine work on trying to analyze May 4th thinking. Um, and what I found was that her analysis of um, understanding how the May 4th thinking was constructed um, privileged uh, the, con the contemporary Euro-American West, and I, I myself am loath to use the East-West dichotomy because it doesn't make sense to me, um, but the Euro, uh, it privileged the Euro-American West as modern and uh, active and virile and progressive and uh, completely um, denigrated the Chinese traditions as um, backward and feminine and uh, uh, effeminate and uh, placid, et cetera. And, um, and one of the things that was really fascinating with that discourse was that it was so well accepted in the literature uh, of the Chinese on both sides of the Taiwan Strait and then in uh, the, those scholars, um, like most of us, who read that literature and find it very worthwhile, and then it, it, you get, it, it absorbs into the discourse. Um, and then it was followed by Cold War ideology um, in the uh, America and, post and World War II allied powers um, to position uh, ourselves as um, a democratic, uh, freedom-loving, active, virile, uh, uh, progressive uh, way, uh, nations with active kinds of thinking, as opposed to the communist bloc, which was, um, as uh, Sergei Gilbo talks about, a bunch of blue-suited ants, in his words. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then that's, uh, uh, from the Chinese perspective, um, followed on the Chinese side with the um, 
uh, the um, cultural revolution discourse of the four olds, which forbid the Chinese from thinking about uh, anything that was considered bourgeois and therefore old the, uh, and outmoded, uh, which thereby also relinquished all of China's culture to uh, a feudal past that was not, uh, uh, nobody would be permitted to think about it in a positive way. So I'm trying to uh, excavate, I was trying to excavate um, Chinese culture and realize that uh, these discourses um, that started, I think, in the Qing <coughs> with Long Yan Chi uh, really shut down our ability to see uh, Chinese traditional culture as a really vibrant and active and engaged uh, and um, open-minded um, and dynamic society producing remarkable works um, of, um, so that was my aim. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I have a question for Tim Brooke about Vermeer's Hat, which I'm sure many of us have read, fabulous book. And uh, you included the metaphor of Indra's net, where each pearl on the net not only has its own dimension, but also reflects all the other pearls, which I think is the most beautiful metaphor for the effects of global connectedness. Um, and I also was so impressed that you were stimulated so much by the visual material, that that's what drew you into your discussion. I noticed that today as well. So do you find that you move in and out of texts and objects and that you seem to have a strong interest in the objects as a source material for some of your work? You've just asked a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> or at least you've, you've, you're provoking me to think of a lot of answers. Um, um, the first thing I'm going to say is that I'm a completely I have no method. I'm a completely chaotic scholar. I just follow what interests me. A text catches my eye, an object, a painting, and then I, I see how that text, object, or painting relates to other texts. I put them all in Indra's net, if you like. I want to see how text, objects, and paintings relate to each other. Um, the, the, uh, I suppose in my next life I'll be born as an art historian. I, I seem to be drifting in that direction. Um, I find paintings um, well, it all started out actually teaching first-year students, teaching them world history. That's where uh, Vermeer's hat is. The, I, I was going to write a book out of my first-year world history course, and I only got to the first two parts, like the first four weeks of the course, and that became the book because I ran out of, I mean, I, it was just too much. But when you're trying to engage students in thinking about, you want to encourage them to think connectively. Um, or at least I did when I started that teaching in the late 80s, early 90s. And so the easiest way to make, to get people to think about connectivity is to give them things they already think they know and then surprise them with, what's, with, what, with what the things or the paintings contain, what they reveal once you start looking and then you, you sort of, you develop this hopefully a, a kind of patient, uh, a patient's looking skill so that you see something, I, I can never see I can never look at a Vermeer painting and not see something I didn't notice before. Now that's just probably a sign of my stupidity as a, in, in, the, in the art historical realm, but you cannot, I cannot see the same painting twice. It, it changes every time I look at it, which is a, which is a thrilling uh, thing for me as a scholar. And I suppose you could say the same thing about a primary source. Every time you read a source that you've already read, you discover a word, a phrase, an allusion that hadn't caught your attention the first time around. So, so for me, the, uh, the act of writing is a, an exciting and, and chaotic business in which you try and, you try and share that, the excitement with your reader. Um, I'll just say one more thing, though, about, um, about comparison. Um, and it was probably the National Security Council rather than the CIA, I think, um, in the early 50s under um, John Foster Dulles that is strategizing this idea of comparing the United States with everywhere else in the world and finding everywhere else in the world to be, to, to, to fall short. And the challenge, and I think um, Ken Pomerantz and Ben Wong bring this out in their books, is to create comparisons that are equal. That is, you, you, you bring both sides into the comparison but also reciprocal, so that the comparison acts to transform how you understand what the other thing is doing. It's a high challenge. Um, 
and it's hard to do. And um, it's also, again, um, I think it was, I don't know, maybe it was Lydia who said this. It, it, no, I think it was you who said this, that it stimulates by putting two things that don't obviously sit side by side together. Yeah. You, it stimulates you to, to interrogate both of the objects more effectively. And um, Lydia, I think you asked me if maybe we might just talk open-endedly about some things in the preceding talks that interested you. Yeah, yeah. so, well, I, I thought, Tim, you do have a method there. <laughs> <laughs> I heard uh, some method there. Um, I, I also share those thoughts about comparison, um, since this conference is about connected connectedness uh, and comparison. Uh, these are different ways of uh, constructing a, a, a research project. I, I, I think um, the, the most stimulating type of comparison, actually I think I've stopped doing comparison for a long time. But if you really wanted to do comparison, it might be a good idea to take some risks. Um, so uh, you just mentioned you know, putting these things um, Un unlikely things together and then see what happens. And that's one way of doing it. For a long time, uh, since I trained in comparative literature, uh, one thing that really uh, uh, is a real challenge, has been a challenge and continues to be a challenge is to identify units of comparison. So uh, Pomeran's book, for, uh, their book uh, really, uh, does it well because they don't compare Europe with, with China, and they identify you know certain geographies uh, in Europe and some areas Jiangnan, in so you don't have a broad uh, sweeping comparison, which uh, basically uh, um, uh, would not work and never works because you, you come up with generalizations without realizing the unit's comparison are flawed. <coughs> That's the problem. So I have been very hesitant about comparing things. Uh, and then I have many questions about units that we bring together, either for comparison or for correlation uh, or for any kind of analysis of causality when you bring things together. So. That unifying principle itself needs interrogation. Now, uh, I think uh, I have learned a lot from this conference. I always enjoy going to an art historian's conference. <laughs> I always learn something new. Uh, and since I'm really the outside outsider here, um, and a well, um, there, there, there are uh, certain um, methods if not methods, there's certain sensitivity among art historians toward uh, the objects they uh, analyze, which include text, always, as we have seen. Um, <coughs> so text as object as well. Now, some of the wonderful questions that have emerged uh, since yesterday and also in today's uh, um, talks really make me think more about what is going on when we do visual translation uh, across traditions. Uh, uh, so then you have the European and then Chinese or uh, Japanese and Chinese and then, uh, so these uh, then uh, uh, kinds of analysis would raise the question of, um, I think uh, Richard who is, who is sick today, couldn't come, uh, uh, did use the idea of visual translation yesterday, I think. I was going to ask him if he could <coughs> elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can, I mean, other people have used this concept, which is very tantalizing. Um, but then in my own discipline, uh, comparative literature, there, there is a thriving field of study called the translation theory. And people basically assume that you work with text you work with words. From an art historical perspective, uh, that it, it has its obvious limitation. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you, then I would put first a question to art historians. When you think of 
bring in disparate um, art objects together for comparison, even if not across national borders. Um, and then you would be implicitly or explicitly constructing uh, commensurabilities, even if you the the goal is to point out dissimilarity. But by bringing them into a relationality, you're already doing some work of translation that is uh, 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 assuming uh, commensurability mm -hmm. there. Uh, so then if we think of translation not just as a metaphor for uh, some kind of a mm -hmm. transformation, not as analogy, and if we want some rigor in our think theoretical thinking about what goes on um, in what Marty just uh, 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 said, uh, transvisual or uh, visual translation, they're two different things. Um, so then uh, in uh, translation theory, this is an open question. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, contentions surrounding translatables, untranslatables. What, one last thing I wanted to say is that uh, the question uh, of different semiotic systems of value uh, uh, comes up all the time because it's the systems of value that determine the similarity or difference. Is it not the other way around? Uh, is the system of value that determines the truth from the fake, so that meanings are generated in always in a historically situated articulation of specific values. I hope it was not too long, the sentence. Mm -hmm. A specific situated articulation of specific values in relation to other values, and always we can't escape a certain uh, system because it's all it, things come in multiple, never alone, and also in relation. <coughs> and so I think that is the challenge. I hope it's not too abstract mm -hmm. in our approach to either um, text, uh, uh, image, or objects. Uh, and I think these challenges to uh, people in uh, uh, translation theory, or also, also to uh, historians, art historians, basically as to how do we even conceptualize that ground of uh, uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. And maybe connected, connectedness is one way uh, 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 getting around the problem, but not really mm -hmm. tackling the problem. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, throw that question to this audience and see what happens. Well. Um I thought I might ask Marty about what would you think of as the structures in England and in China that allowed for the concept of equality under the law to emerge in those two cases in, in your study? Oh boy, that's a big one. <laughs> but it, um, it, it does get to what Lydia was just talking about. Uh, one of the things I try to show in the book is that um, the radicals in mainly in 18th century England were facing problems that were not terribly dissimilar from those that um, they were reading translations of Chinese texts, political documents, policy documents that had been translated first in French, then into English. As far as I know, no one's ever looked to see if the translations were any good. I have. And uh, for, they're remarkably good, actually, if you understand 18th century English. There are some things they leave out there, some things they didn't get. But, um, but they, they did get the fact that these guys were writing about problems that they shared, okay? And another premise of the book is that issues of equality are, are structural. There's a sense in which I think it, it factors into any society. In fact, uh, Franz de Wald has this, um, uh, this, uh, vi this video on, on YouTube, which you may have seen, it, it's, it's very, very popular where um, he conducts an experiment and he gives a, a monkey, he has two monkeys each with its own cage. If they give him a rock, he gives them a cucumber. And so they get used to this. They're doing work, I give you a rock, I get a cucumber. Suddenly he gives one of them a, a, a grape. And so the other one immediately goes and gets the rock. Give me one of those too. He gives him a cucumber and he throws it at him. 
and, and shakes the cage. <clears throat> and you know, don't tell me equality is a Western concept, okay? Because <laughs> because uh, monkeys understand Were those Western this. monkeys. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, right. This is very well. No, the real question for the historian is how is it? To, and again, anyone with children knows that they have a very natural sense. You give, you give Johnny ice cream when he does his homework and you don't give Shirley ice cream when she finishes her homework. She's going to know that. Um, the real issue is how is it that governing um, structures are able to convince people to accept inequality despite the fact that we all more or less naturally understand it. So in any case, uh, in, in England and in, in this case in Song China, most of the texts they were reading were from Song China, and there are some really brilliant progressive uh, essays. These, are, these still come across as progressive even today. And people like Samuel Johnson are, are reading this and they're saying, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Not because they're saying, oh, now I've been influenced by the Chinese. This, is, this doesn't come into it. It's rather, oh, these guys were, you know, were facing some of the same issues and uh, maybe we can use some of these methods, you know, to, uh, to, to uh, push our agenda here. So, and, and they say explicitly many times that, that we share with them these values. Uh, the notion that we do not and never could share those values uh, comes much later, largely with Hegel. Uh, you could push it back to Montesquieu, I suppose, but you don't get a lot of that in the 18th century. It's more of a 19th century construction, the notion that everybody, uh, different races have different Volksgeister, right? And, uh, and, that, um, and that people are incommensurable. But again, in order to, to um, to make any kind of comparison, you have to first establish that they're, that you've got your units right and that you're comparing the same thing. So I try to I find the situation where these people are doing the same kind of work with, with their heads. And in many cases, they come up with very similar um, conclusions even when they haven't read one another, even when they, I'll give you one more example. I think it's really wonderful. This is from Spectator, uh, Joseph Addison, um, was um, arguing against the practice in England at that time where, where if someone, say, suffered from a flood or, or from a uh, shipwreck or something like that, this was seen as a punishment from God. Can you imagine that? People thinking that someone suffering from a misfortune like a flood might have been punished from, by God? In any case, he uses logic to overcome this, uh, this error, and he basically... Yeah, uh, well, it's still used now. I mean, uh, some parts of the but country. But I hear that that argument is now used against CIA. Okay. Well, in any case, Addison, Addison would argue against it, and here's how he did it. He says, well, look, let's say a ship sinks. There may have been some sinners on the ship, but, but surely there were some people who were not sinners, <laughs> right? So this is ridiculous. It's just natural chance. And so he uses a reductio form of argument. That's called a reductio ad absurdum, right? Well, uh, Ouyang Xiu writing in the 11th century, which um, uh, he, um, again, someone had taken an ax to a statue in a temple, and a few weeks later, there was a flood that killed thousands of people, and everyone's going around saying, oh, the, the god you know, from the temple uh, was angry and punished us, and so Ouyang Xiu publishes this essay, and he says, okay, let me get this straight. You mean to tell me this god had the power to kill thousands of innocent people, but was unable to defend himself against one guy with an ax? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> right? So again, he's using a reductio. He's exactly the same kind of argument. And there's no way that Addison knew about Ouyang Xiao. He wouldn't have known about that, that at least not that essay. Uh, so anyway, this, this is the kind of, um, I suppose, the, the approach I've taken. Can we take some questions from the audience? It's not on. Sir, I think one of the issues people uh, find it difficult to engage with is the extent to which uh, nature provides fundamental datum, fixed bases from which everything has to be based upon what is already there in nature. So 
wherever you, if you live on top of an oil well or if you live in, in on beside a, a flowing river or whatever it is, this is, is going to have a m big impact on, on you. And it's an endless source of structural inequalities, which you can compensate for, et cetera. But in my, in, in my sense, people avoid acknowledging the, influ the constraining influence of nature because it makes them feel uncomfortable, because it makes us feel less free. It, it denies our freedom. And I think because, of it, because of we worship freedom as being a primary quality, we say everything has to be based on, in, on, on freedom as the most important basis of everything, it means we cannot accept constraints, even if they are the constraints which come from, don't come from human beings or from institutions, they're in nature. How, how, do you think it is possible to deal with these constraints? Are, are you talking about global warming? Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I say, literally every single, if you, uh, if you live in a particular place with the environmental, mm -hmm. the environment mm -hmm. constrains you in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just saying that that's, that's something which is, in, in my view, in the history of culture, as it's written nowadays, it is very rarely uh, acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can I respond to that? Um, I, 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 I see the question, and I think I deal with it somewhat differently than you would. I'm interested in, in um, um, uh, when normal conditions become abnormal um, under uh, climate change, um, epidemics, um, food supply, when people's, n what, what, what people normally expect when that is not possible or not deliverable, then they have to respond to that crisis in their, their ecological crisis. And one of the reasons I think why connective history is able to sort of join comparative history in the last decade or so is because more scholars are taking a global perspective, so that if temperatures are falling in London in 1587, uh, temperatures are also falling in Beijing in 1587, and both those societies have to work out what to do as expected conditions are no longer expected. So that, uh, I bring that into my work, going, going sort of to the state of normal and understanding that as a comparative or connective framework is beyond my capacity, but perhaps other people are doing that. Yeah, but I think, I mean, I think that's a very good example, I think, of the way, uh, for instance, in, uh, I mean, working with neuroscience, there's an endless work on um, therapies dealing with people who have deficits, you know, strokes, um, congenital abnormalities, uh, and the literature on that is, 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 is enormous. And there are societies prepared to invest enormous amounts of money in trying to compensate for those, those things. What is not acknowledged is the fact that regardless of those, there is fundamental given differences. I mean, I happen to be colorblind. I mean, it's, you know, and I was told by a, a Dutch doctor that I couldn't have a job as an art historian because I was, uh, I was colorblind. Yeah, I mean, uh, just as a, I guess I should ask a question of the panel, but I was just thinking that, that this kind of environmental determinism was, was actually quite popular in the 1950s and 1960s in a very different kind of moral environment. Uh, so that might be interesting to revisit, to revisit that literature. But um, my question was <coughs> about comparisons and connectivity. Um, that in many ways, since, since you know, all of you are writing in English most of the time, that there's always an implicit comparison, right, simply by the act of writing in English about, uh, about Chinese materials. Uh, 
And so I was wondering whether you could reflect on that, how you use language, whether you devise new terms of analysis, whether there's a way of avoiding an almost uh, inevitable uh, linguistic bias in, in making these comparisons um, simply by the act of writing. And maybe, you know, if you have written in Chinese about Chinese materials, does that make a difference? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'll just take up this question. Um, when I wrote uh, my first book, Translingual Practice, I actually thought about this problem. And I said, would, I think, now that, you know, your question brings it back to my mind, the, I added a footnote uh, that is the language and the categories that you use in, in writing in Chinese, would that absorb you from uh, those discourses that had already been imported to China, uh, some, of, some of which came via Japan. And the Chinese, modern Chinese vocabulary uh, uh, consists of so many uh, loan words and uh, return loan words, um, so many, uh, I supply a whole glossary of them. And modern Chinese would, not, would be incomprehensible in unintelligible if you were to remove these foreign elements from its vocabulary and if you were to remove the syntax that would not have been comprehensible to someone from the 19th century and earlier. So that's the extent of the change. So writing in English has its own uh, constraints. Writing in Chinese doesn't help you solve the problem because I also write in Chinese. And uh, you're confronted with the same issues because of this uh, mutual penetration, you know, in different ways. I mean, Chinese, modern Chinese has been transformed more uh, uh, than, well, by English and foreign languages than the other way around. But then uh, merely looking at the vocabulary will not solve the problem. It's really about the civiliz civilizational hierarchy that many of us have been talking about. Uh, so we're dealing really with a larger issue here. Uh, no, I was just uh, observing JP. Oh, uh, it's five o'clock. Okay. <laughs> oh. So we were, ta but did you want to say something or did you? Yeah. Um, um, what, one of the things I try and do in my writing is avoid using Asian words because when I'm writing for a more popular audience, they see it, they go blank, they don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm, I'm always looking for words that are analogically close or expressions that, that function as analogies. Um, is, uh, well, for example, I don't... Because the word, I mentioned this uh, earlier today, because the word empire is so loaded with particular historical experience in the West, I find using Daguo a much, a much better way of allowing me to say, what is it about Asian empires that, it, that would be lost if you reduced it to the case of the Roman Empire or the British Empire, that these are different? And so, so I try and introduce in... Asian terms in English. I try and find English equivalents so that we we maintain a ground of familiarity. Uh, we can do it in our, I mean, in this room, I can say any word in Chinese and it will be understood, but we step outside the room and the word it becomes meaningless. And if we, as educators, for our, just for our undergraduates, let alone as writers for a larger, larger public, want to be able to communicate, we can't use uh, well, we may, you could maybe use one awkward foreign term, but you use more than that and your readers won't read you. So this is a challenge we need to pay attention to, I think. Could I, I what, Tim, you touched on a very important uh, matter here. Um, uh, uh, of course, it's a translingual matter here. It's political. Yeah. So I actually made the argument in uh, The Clash of Empires that the translation of, of uh, Zhongguo into China it, 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 it imputes a, a certain political relationship, and, and China that cannot, I mean, I'm talking about incommensurability. We have a history, political history of the, such translation, and I think uh, I usually tell my students, don't accept this translation. Uh, you should translate it 
as central states. Central states, plural. And then uh, and Middle Kingdom is a wrong translation. <laughs> it's just, uh, uh, I don't know what the missionaries were thinking. Well, I, an, another way around this <laughs> is don't uh, avoid the words like China that don't work. So instead of calling the struggle, the, the war in 1894, a Sino-Japanese war, it's a Qing Meiji war. It's not a Sino-Japanese war. Yeah. So we start from transforming the language in which we even discuss the problems. And then that allows us to rethink those categories. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, but then we really lose our Chinese purpose. Um, well, why? Well, when, uh, for instance, um, I was um, once in a situation where somebody um, correctly, of course, uh, of voiced objections uh, to uh, Western archaeologists coming into Xinjiang in the years before World War I and, um, and robbing China of its <laughs> cultural heritage. And uh, at the time, I said, well, of course, this was objectionable, but who was actually robbed? Was it China or was it the Great Qing Empire? <laughs> and, you know, that was not a politically okay thing to say. The, con uh, the conversation very, s very quickly went somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, I'm not yeah. trying to justify the incursions. Sure. Sure. It's just a question of, you know, who are the victims here? Yeah. A very good question. In, in fact, uh, uh, this question came up when the, uh, in, well, shortly after uh, uh, the Republic of China uh, came into being. Uh, it's the name Zhonghua uh, Mingguo. Um, and then, uh, and, and the Japanese then, um, well, the Japanese wanted to call it So there were diplomatic disputes, dispatches sent back and forth, and it also got into the media in Japan and in China. So should it be called or And then finally, one of the Japanese uh, uh, defenses uh, 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 basically stated that um, you don't seem to object to the English word China, and Zhina is China. Why do you object to the Japanese use of Zhina? Well, so th this, is, this was an open-ended question, so the people rejected Zhina um, Mingguo, but people have not rejected China. You see, you see the absurdity. Or Hindu Jina. So, so all of the absurdity of it, there's no logic to it. There's no logic. And I thought scholars should be at least logical. So, <laughs> right? If you, I'm you, like a politician. You, I'm like a politician. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to end our roundtable, but thank you.